Well, we're into Philippians chapter 3 this evening. Philippians chapter 3, you may want to turn in your Bibles or just listen as I read. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider, consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's pray together. Father God, we ask that as you have been with us in praise and celebration, so the scripture will come strangely alive to us now. And you will reach across the thousands of years that have gone by since it was written and down into this tent in Skegness in 1994 and touch all our lives by the power of this book under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Amen. Well, here we are this evening in Philippians chapter 3, halfway through this amazing uh, book, simple, personal, pastoral, and yet filled with helpful teaching for all of us in our churches, as churches and as individuals. Now, if we could have the overhead projector screen on, you'll see the four ways I'm going to unpack this chapter tonight. Again, you might want to note some of these headings. And do please keep your Bibles open through our time together this evening. A visionary church. That's the title of tonight, a visionary church. And in verses 1 to 6 and 18 and 19, and you'll see why I've jumped to the end of the chapter when we get there, a vision out of focus. Verses 7 to 11, a vision in focus. Verses 12 to 16, the now vision. Verses 17, 20 and 21, the not yet vision. Now do take a few moments to get that in focus in your minds because it's going to form uh, the structure into which area uh, I bring the scripture this evening. Vision out of focus, 1 to 6, 18 and 19. Vision in focus, 7 to 11. The now vision, 12 to 16. And the not yet vision, verses 17, 20 and 21. You can turn it off now if you would. I may need it again a little later on. So with your Bibles open, you come to chapter 3 and you read, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. This is where Paul shows himself to be a typical preacher, using the word finally when we're only halfway through uh, the message. Couldn't possibly be finally. At least 40% of this book is still to come. Although, to be fair to Paul, uh, it's a finally that means furthermore or there will now also be additional material. It's not, uh, to the original readers, something which means, and I'm about to close in a sentence or two, which is good news, because he isn't. There's another two chapters to come. Finally, my brothers, or furthermore, in addition to the two chapters I've already written to you, rejoice in the Lord, that distinctive phrase in the book of Philippians, joy, the 14 times concept repeated through the book, remember to be joyful, in the Lord, even when you're in trouble, even when there's disunity in your church, even when you feel pretty rough about your own Christian faith and walk, don't forget that joy doesn't depend on circumstances, but depends on your relationship with the Lord. And then he says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. In other words, what's coming now is to some extent uh, an embellishment, a development, a repetition even of what's gone before, and it may even be what he said in a previous letter to them. And I'm not bothered about saying this, says Paul, because you need to hear it, and it is a safeguard for you. And so that's why in preaching terms, we sometimes need to repeat again and again certain truths so that they get hammered in, not simply to our heads, but into all of our lives and form part of our experience. A little like the country preacher who was advising the young country preacher about how to preach a sermon, and he said every sermon should have three points. First you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you've told them. And those three points will work for any sermon. Now there's sense in that. A threefold repetition of the main point until we get it. And so Paul repeats himself, making sure the Philippians grasp the vital teaching he brings to them. And so they won't even for one moment believe that what he says is somehow trivial or passing. But its repetition will ensure that they understand his letter matters. And it matters because it is a safeguard. And it's a word that's used to describe a fence or a barrier when a mule, for example, will be coming down a steep mountain road and with an owner on its back, or more likely the owner in front with a huge pack on the mule, and the mule slips against a a rock or stone and would perhaps career over the edge of the cliff and down into a precipice. But he doesn't because there's a fence that's been built up and although he might knock into it roughly and be slightly bruised in the process, he is kept from sliding off into the abyss by the safeguard, the fence. The fence doesn't block the path, it blocks the way to disaster. And the book of Philippians, Paul says, this letter to you is like a safeguard, like a fence, so that in all of your life you will not hit disaster. You won't find yourself sliding over the abyss into problem or error. 
here. And in fact, not only the book of Philippians, but the whole of Scripture is this kind of safeguard. Why do we need to know the Bible? Why do we need to understand its truth? Not simply to grasp a vision of Jesus, though we must do that positively, but negatively to stop us sliding off into error. The whole of the Bible, from Genesis through to Revelation, ought to be known to us. Firstly, there was Adam and Eve, and then there was Eve. All of the Bible is a safeguard. Like in the old days when there was a fire in your heart and a fire guard was placed around it, the fire guard didn't stop you wandering around your front room. It protected you from the area of danger. And that's what the Word of God is, and we neglect it in, at our peril. That's why Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Your word have I hid in my heart. Why? So that I might not sin against you. The Word of God, the book of Philippians included, is written for a hedge, a barrier, a safeguard around us. And if you want to protect your life in the future from drifting off into heretical thinking or from moral failure or from going off the rails in your Christian life, you must soak yourself in the Word because it will be a safeguard to you. And you neglect the Word at your peril. If you neglect it, the safeguard will be damaged, broken, and in some cases totally absent, and the dangers beckon us and await us. Never forget that the Bible is designed as a safeguard for us. That's why Paul wrote to the Philippians. And then suddenly he changes tack almost out of the blue. Watch out for the dogs. Where does this come from? It's led some scholars to believe that what we've got here is two letters glued together. And actually, these are two bits of two different letters. Actually, I, I think more likely, Paul simply got to the end of a particular section, perhaps put his pen down for a while, and then coming back to the letter, got all steamed up about these people who were really being damaging in the church. And what happened was the vision got out of focus when these people came into focus. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Now, who are these people? Well, wandering around in the first century, there were those, for example, to whom the book of Galatians is addressed, who talked about the fact that if you wanted to be a Christian, you had to believe in Jesus. So far, so good. But that in addition, you had to be circumcised in order to be really converted. And so they were the Jesus Plus group, sometimes called Judaizers, but had a range of names. But they were those who thought you needed something in addition to faith in Jesus Christ. In this case, circumcision. And Paul calls them dogs and mutilators of the flesh. I mean, I feel sorry for the dogs. The animals often get criticized in the Bible. They're used often. Jesus calls Herod a fox. John the Baptist calls the Pharisees snakes. Amos calls some rich women in Bashan cows. It's horribly impolite, the whole thing, really. And Paul calls these Judaizers dogs. Now, they're not the local domestic dog. They're uh, animals that hunt in packs in the ancient world, scavish in rubbish dumps, and would attack any animal and sometimes even a wounded human, almost more like a jackal or a hyena. So a dog is a great term of, of abuse. And he calls them mutilators of the flesh. You, I mean, it's the strongest term of abuse. Now, circumcision is actually a relatively minor surgical procedure. It is, it's true, on a rather delicate part of the anatomy, but nevertheless, it is a relatively minor thing. It certainly couldn't be described as a mutilation. It's just that Paul is so livid with these people, that's why he calls them dogs and mutilators, because they are robbing the church of their birthright of faith in Jesus alone and are adding another requirement to come to faith. The reformers themselves uh, in the 15 and 1600s were finding themselves fighting this same battle. And so their great cry was sola fides, by faith alone, not by faith and works, not by faith and doing something else, not by faith and circumcision, just by trust in Jesus. And Paul is angry, very direct, very blunt. And these words sound harsh to Western ears. Why? Because we are simply not used to that language. And secondly, tragically, because we are so tolerant of everything, we don't know when intolerance is the right thing to be. Jesus was intolerant of sin, and so should we be. Paul was intolerant of heresy and error, and we should be intolerant too. Not rude, not abrasive, 
peacemaking and peace loving, but bluntly attacking things when they are wrong and being willing to stand up for what is right. We need, I believe in the church, a new spiritual gift of blunt truth telling at times. When we rescue the church, you see, why was Paul angry about this? Because he recognized that if he let this go, if he let it pass, if he let the Judaizers win the day and Christians started being circumcised in order to be real Christians, the whole of the church will be polluted with another gospel. And people would for centuries be trapped into a works mentality for Christian faith instead of a by faith alone. And we need a new cutting edge to our defense of the truth and our passion for it. And the Bible teaches this in, in lots of places. I came across a quotation uh, a while ago from the Living Bible about Nehemiah speaking to people ever so gently and pastorally and sensitively, as we would approve of. He says this about those who let their children marry outside the faith. Quote, So I argued with these parents and cursed them and punched a few of them <laughs> and knocked them around and pulled out their hair. <laughs> and then they vowed before God that they wouldn't let their children intermarry with non-Jews. <laughs> well, there's a surprise. What pastoral sensitivity we have here. What warmth. What a way of dealing with people. How to win friends and influence people. The Nehemiah School of Compassion. So what we have here, you see, in the New Testament is a reminder that throughout the Bible there is an earthy confrontation comes, that comes when error threatens the very heart of the gospel. And we need this new passion. You see, Paul saying, look, you think you've got something to be proud of because you've been circumcised and some of these people haven't, you think you're better than them. Listen to me. I am someone who was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm a real, real, real Jew. I didn't come to this later on in life as an understanding. And I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, the best tribe of all. And I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and I went to the best university, and I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, so beat that. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I, if, if there is anybody who can claim credit for works, boy, I can. But in a moment, we're going to see that he's got the vision in focus. And he doesn't claim anything for that. And so he is utterly convinced that all the works he can pile up to this side compared with Jesus are nothing, and that he must trust Jesus alone. Brothers and sisters, we are in danger of the same kind of legalism in the church today. We may not insist on circumcision. That may not be our particular Jesus plus something. But often our church culture is as much of a barrier to people becoming Christians as circumcision was then. We invite people to be converted to Christ, then they've got to be converted to the church. And we hold some of the things that we do in our church as almost of equal importance to what we do with Jesus, so we become terribly religious. Religion is one of the things which stops people coming to Jesus, not one of the things which draws them. And so this whole legalistic framework of things as well as Jesus must be swept away or our churches will be caught up in all this dead, dead legalism which will crush the work of the Spirit, which will quench the power of the life of God. And it will be the old wineskins that crack when the life of the Spirit comes through. One of the reasons why there's had to be so many expressions of new styles of church life for which I give praise to God has been that many of the old structures were utterly resistant to change. And when the Spirit came to live inside those structures, it cracked, it couldn't contain the life of the Spirit because we were so bound by laws and rules and regulations that weren't from Scripture, but they were part of our heritage or tradition or any number of other things. The Spirit wanted to come and burst through with His glorious life. And change has to come to our churches if we're to see this miracle of new life bursting out. And change has to come to us so that we're calling people to Jesus and to Jesus alone. The vision must not get out of focus. It isn't Jesus and my denomination. It isn't Jesus and my style of churchmanship. It isn't Jesus and the way I worship. It isn't Jesus and the time I worship. It isn't Jesus and any other thing. It is Jesus alone that saves. 
I'm committed to my own denomination and to the things that are its distinctives. And I value them, and I value the distinctives that other denominations bring, and, and it's right that we honor them. But at bottom, the focus for evangelical Christians is Jesus as revealed in his word. And we're calling people to faith in him alone. And legalism cannot be allowed to stop the free flow of the gospel. And when we examine our churches, time and time again, we find things in the way of preaching Jesus, which are nothing to do with the Bible and nothing to do with faith, but are stuff that's grown up over the years that we're locked into, the dead works that need to be repented of. You see, tradition is a wonderful thing. But traditionalism is dreadfully killing Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living, and we need to repent of it. It is totally different, and so we need to be set free from the chains which bind us in terms of traditions which are not of God and are now dead and holding us back. On the other hand, the end of the chapter, which we need to skip over to, the later verses... 18, I've told you before how many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, and their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. These were people who were at the opposite end of the spectrum as far as the Philippians were concerned. They were the legalistic folk over here, and there were people who had no rules and values at all. If that was Jesus plus, this is Jesus minus. They were people who had no respect for the law and the laws of God or any other kind of law, and their basic posture was, anything goes as far as my body is concerned. I can do what I want. I'm free in Christ. My body's not the important thing. My spirit is the important thing, so what I do with my body doesn't really matter. And so all sorts of gross sins took place in this particular group because they had misunderstood what Jesus came to speak about, and instead of liberty, they'd got license. And in the church today, we have Christians at both ends of that extreme. They mistake liberty and put it in a box and it becomes legalism. Or they mistake liberty for license, open the box altogether, and there is a glorious mess which usually involves sin and despair and failure. Usually moral failure. And that's why in the church we must fight both licentiousness, the license problem, and the legalism problem. Thousands of our churches are in bondage to legalism. They're not following Jesus and Jesus alone and letting the work of the Spirit flow through their structures. They are in bondage to other things other than God's Word and the power of the Spirit. We must be released from that into true Christian freedom. On the other hand, there are those who've done away with all the rules and regulations and now feel free to sin in any way possible, believing God's bound to forgive them and the body doesn't really matter. I consistently meet people in my pastoral charge who have deserted one partner and are now sleeping with another and say it will have no effect on their Christian lives. They are absolutely wrong. It will have an effect on their Christian lives. The body isn't detached from the spirit. We are whole as people. And there may be men and women tonight who bought into that lie. And your moral lives are not upright and not what God is saying. You cannot walk with God and commit moral sin believing that really you're just walking with him somewhere up here. It sooner or later will affect your spirituality and it probably will be sooner. Sin remains sin however we spiritualize it. God help the unholy, licentious church. It may be powerful in the short term, but it will be broken in the medium and the long term. We have to come to terms with that. Brothers and sisters, our lives are like a large canvas. The legalists would have us with a small canvas with a very ornate frame stuck around it and numbers in there which say one, two, three, and a little palette which says one, two, three. One is red, two is blue, three is green, and our lives are painting by numbers. God just tells you what to do in every single circumstance and you just do it. No wrong. The folk who believe in license have got a huge massive canvas with no frame at all and the edges are ripped. The colors are freely available everywhere, but no brushes, you just throw the paint at it at random. <laughs> the liberty view of the gospel is a canvas, which is a very large one, with clear boundaries around the outside, God rules. There's no painting by numbers, though. We're children of God, sons and daughters, and he allows us to paint on that picture a glorious freedom, a technical, a wonderful landscape of our own creating, because he gives us that freedom within the framework of his rules and values. 
but we have wonderful freedom, great opportunities to express ourselves personally and corporately. The church needn't be in a narrow box. What you're doing in your town, I needn't do in mine, and vice versa. What a relief. There's wonderful freedom within all that. And when we're painting our picture, sometimes we make a mess and we get it wrong and we consult God again. And you know, God's so wonderful that he can recreate that picture and turn the messy blob in the middle into something beautiful for him because he's the master artist if we let him do that. And so Paul says, look, the vision gets out of focus. The legalists are wrong. Don't ever be in bondage to that. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's him alone. And it's not Jesus minus anything. You dare not live your life, any one of you, any one of us, in any way other than in holy living. The body does matter. And their belly is their shame. Gluttony is still a sin. Sexual immorality is still a sin. Any kind of abuse of our body is a sin if it stops us being the holy people of God. And we need liberty, genuine, genuine Christian freedom. For freedom Christ has set you free. Paul writes to the Galatians, uh, and if he'd known I was going to say quite this tonight, he'd have included it in Philippians 2. Uh, <laughs> for freedom Christ has set us free. So the vision gets out of focus. Now how do we bring it, bring it back into focus? Verse 7. Here we have Paul with the focus on Jesus alone. I consider it all lost now for the sake of knowing Christ, all this Hebrew of the Hebrew stuff. What's more, compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, I consider it all rubbish that I may gain Christ. Compared with him, everything else is, quote, rubbish. It's, a, it's a, a, quite a crude, direct word. Uh, it, it can mean um, the rubbish on a rubbish tip, or it can mean excrement, a uh, dung, uh, Probably a more accurate word is, is one I, I wouldn't choose to use publicly. Uh, it's a very strong word. I count everything else rubbish compared with knowing him, this Jesus. And I want to know him, be, have a righteousness that comes not from the law. Righteousness of my own that comes from the law, sorry, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that is from God. And I want to know, verse 10, Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So what is the in-focus vision? The in-focus vision is to know Christ, which is the a Greek version of the Hebrew Messiah, the anointed, the sent one from God, the Christ. I want to know the power of the anointed one from God, and I want to know the power of his resurrection and fellowship in his suffering. That's the vision, brothers and sisters, tonight, that we'll know the power of the resurrection. What a wonderful thing that is to learn, that it's the power of the resurrection. Now, let me just say that you can't have the power of something that didn't happen. I mean, it just can't, it makes no sense to me at all. That's why it seems surprising that so many people doubt the resurrection. I mean, I understand in a way why they do, but it seems most odd to me I wouldn't want to have the power of something that was a lie. What power is there in that? I mean, can you imagine Peter and John on the day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday feeling really depressed and discouraged and saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to keep this Christian thing going? Subscriptions are bound to go down after this, you know. What can we do? I know, let's us go, you and me, you know, as fishermen, heavily armed with fish, and let's race down the tomb and get that crack guard of troops by surprise, smack them on the head with a bit of cod, <laughs> roll the stone away, get the body out somehow unseen, do something with it, and then fake it like we're really happy. And wander around saying, Jesus is alive. And you can imagine John saying to Peter, but, but Peter, Jesus isn't alive, he means dead. And Peter says, yeah, I know that, but the idea of Jesus is alive, is alive. John says, what? Well, you know, like he will, he'll be alive in our hearts. John says, lie, you mean? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't bear thinking about. Brothers and sisters, the power of the resurrection is possible because the resurrection happened. 
because Jesus really did burst out of the tomb. That's the only way you can know the power of the resurrection, because Jesus is alive. His bones are not rotting in some Galilean hillside. He's alive forever and ever and ever. Down the ages, dozens of people have tried to disprove this. Lou Wallace, the governor of Alabama, started off to write a book to prove that the resurrection didn't happen and ended up writing Ben-Hur, which showed that he did. <laughs> Frank Morrison, a lawyer journalist, started to write a book about how it didn't actually happen and ended up writing a book called Who Moved the Stone? Because he couldn't figure out who had. <laughs> if Jesus hadn't done it. Brothers and sisters, Confucius is dead. Muhammad is dead. Darwin is dead. Marx is dead. But Jesus is alive. <laughs> the power of the resurrection. We need to know the power of some event that really did happen. And that we'll know that power in our lives. Not simply the power in a kind of buzz, experiential sense, making me feel good. But the power to live a holy life. The power to say no to sin. The power to be a good father, mother or friend. The resurrection power to tell the truth when you'd rather lie. The resurrection power to live a life of high moral standing. The resurrection power to see the fruit of that spirit worked out in our lives. And when we know that power, we're then ready also to know the fellowship of the sufferings. That's the focus of the vision. Good Friday through to Easter Sunday. Calvary as well as Easter Sunday. All together, brothers and sisters, suffering comes into our lives and we have to face it with the power of the resurrection. Sometimes we come to spring harvest and we expect to get some kind of high, and we often do, and praise the Lord for that, but we go back expecting we're never going to suffer again. And it's really wonderful. Oh, we wouldn't articulate that, but it's true. That's how we're subconsciously feeling. We've solved it all, we've cracked it, we're feeling great. We wander on. And when we go back into our churches, you can tell by the worried look in their faces that you're back from spring harvest. <laughs> You're floating three inches off the floor, for goodness sake. You're all so jolly holy, incredibly spiritual, big smiles the first Sunday back, blessed you, brother, to everybody. <laughs> and then you'll be there, that supercilious look on your face, having all been blessed up at something. I've been to the mount. <laughs> you haven't, you've been to Butlins, for goodness sake. <laughs> Get real. We must know the power of the resurrection in the place of suffering. In the real places, the hard places, the hurting places where things go wrong, where things fail. Paul knew that. Paul's not writing this letter from a holiday camp. He's writing it from prison. <laughs> platform to support you in moments like this. <laughs> that I may know the power of the resurrection and the power of the struggle. That is, in the struggle, 
I'll also know he's suffering. And brothers and sisters, we are going to go back to difficult circumstances. Now, the brilliant thing is that for some of you, God's going to ch have changed those circumstances before you get back. And I praise God for that. But for others of you, he's going to change you before you get back. And the circumstances won't be any different, but you'll have a new power. Perhaps you know the story of Joe Scriven, who grew up with very little schooling, didn't have a happy family upbringing that we know of, was struggling through much of his life, and got engaged to a girl in the early 1840s, who on the night before they were due to be married, was tragically drowned in an accident. And he was left heartbroken, and he emigrated from uh, this country to Canada, where, with failing health himself, though still young, he worked among handicapped folk, and eventually found uh, another woman to whom he became engaged. And again, tragically, during that engagement, after a brief illness, his fiancée died. He then got increasingly ill and through the rest of his life fought bouts of illness, sometimes a sort of depressive illness and other times physical illness and really struggled with that. Never married. And when he died, there was a manuscript found at his bedside. It was a poem. It was eventually turned and set to music. And in all of that life of anguish of a catalogue of disasters, Joe Scriven was to write, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations, remember that? Is there trouble anywhere? What a powerful poem, what a hymn about a man who went through incredible struggles but whose faith was never dimmed because he understood the power of the resurrection in the struggle. That's the vision, brothers and sisters. The vision is not of an escapist, make-believe world where everything is always happy. It's a vision of glorious power from the risen Christ to give us supernatural dynamic day by day. We're not calling folk at Spring Harvest to escape from reality, but to experience the ultimate reality, the reality which is him, the risen Christ. So that's the focus of the vision. Now there's a now part of this vision too, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press ahead towards the goal, verse 14, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So the first part of the now vision is pressing on toward the goal and the prize. Paul, interestingly, switches the metaphors there. The the goal is the finishing tape on the athletic track, and the prize is the gold medal at the end of it. And so you're stretching for both the goal to finish the race and the prize. But you're always pressing onward. You're never retreating, you're never standing still. You're always pressing forward on to get the prize. And Paul is saying, you need your vision in focus, not out of focus, and you need a now vision. It needs to be what we're doing at this point in time. Today is the day of salvation, not simply for conversion, but for pressing on in the things of God. Strip off all the baggage. Get rid of the excess weights. Confess your sin. Put aside anything that's slowing you down and charge on towards the goal, pressing on, straining is the word he uses, making sure that you get there. Sometimes you catch those slow motion pictures of athletes straining for the line, the veins in their neck bulging as every part of them is tense to achieve the finishing line. What an incredible thought that is. And so tonight we are called to be not those who backpedal in the face of adversity, not those who even stand still, but those who are constantly joining this great army of athletes who are pressing on, letting nothing deter them, and looking at our lives, examining our lives, so that we are the athletes we need to be. No athlete turns up for the start of the Olympic 100 metres wearing a duffel coat and carrying a rucksack. They, it's, it's as as lightweight as possible. And so we need to be confessing our sins so that those 
things fall from us and we need to be focusing on this Jesus compared with whom everything else is rubbish and saying, Lord, I want to be stripped off and ready for action and I want to cut away all those things that are stopping me strain ahead towards the prize. So the call is for an army of athletes straining on towards the prize, pushing ahead, forging on with God, making a commitment that will do that. Whatever the pressures, whatever the temptations, whatever the anxieties, that by his resurrection power in the struggle will still charge on and push on for the sake of the kingdom because that's our priority now. And then he says, some of you, this is verse 15 following, are going to disagree about this, but all of us who are mature should take the view I'm taking. Which sounds a bit arrogant, really. If you're mature, you'll agree with me. Uh, but what he is really saying is, the mature will understand the view I've mentioned, that you should be focusing on Christ. And if you think differently, God will need to make that clear to you so that you will be focused on Christ. There will be differences. So the two things of the now vision are, press on, let nothing hold you back, and two, recognize that your differences are not as significant as that which binds you together, which unifies you, which draws you into the other people of God. And so all the squabbles and the falling out should be set aside in the light of pushing on towards this goal. Don't squabble and fall out in such a way that the goal gets missed. Dozens of our churches are in this state today. They're absorbed in huge debate about trivia while the world goes to hell. That cannot be right. We're absorbed not in a focus on Jesus, but, and sadly, not even some theological debate which one might treasure or value. But at what point in the service the offering comes? Or which hymn book we ought to be using? Thank you for agreeing with that. I'm glad that uh, rang a bell in someone's church. So we find ourselves absorbed in the trivia of the moment, focused on totally the wrong things. Doesn't that happen in our churches? How many of us were moved last night who were here in the top when Nicola and Sandra were interviewed about the faith? I mean, what an amazing story that is. Here we are in our churches arguing about nothing and two people are going back to start a family in the middle of a war. Somebody's got their priorities wrong somewhere here. And not only that, forget those believers who suffer in that way. Jesus says, I'm supposed to be the focus. Get me in the right place and all these other things fall into their own place. When I was in theological college, I occasionally got letters from church secretaries who said, Dear Mr. Gore Crodger, we're very much looking forward to you coming to preach. We enclose an order of service. And there were these fatal words at the bottom. Do please feel free to change anything in this order of service <laughs> if you would like to. On one occasion, I moved the offering from before a hymn to after it. I stood in the church and I said, now we'll have the offering, and nobody moved. I said, now we'll have the offering. And a, a little man came up to where the pulpit was and he whispered, he called me down and he whispered to me, he said, we don't have the offering now. So I stood up and I said, we don't have the offering now. And of course the congregation thought I was stupid. They knew we didn't have the offering now. <laughs> I then announced the hymn. And then I said, and now we'll take the offering. And like clockwork, people appeared from nowhere and collected the offering. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we spent a lot of time in our church life, haven't we, in the last few years, arguing about next to nothing. When you think about it, what kind of songs we ought to sing in our church. Do you know that God's more interested in your heart than the style of the song? We've argued about what kind of way we ought to be doing communion. We've argued about pews or chairs. We've argued about the length of the service. We've argued about so many things. Of course we need to think about those things, but what really matters? What matters is that everything is rubbish compared with Jesus and we're to be pressing on and let no baggage, church baggage, denominational baggage or personal baggage get in the way of us following on with this Jesus and having him as the focus. It's very, very important this that we grasp it. Otherwise, we'll simply be going back to our churches to be slightly more spiritual in a church which is already rotten. Now, some of us are in great churches. I'm not in any sense knocking the local church. I gladly and willingly identify with it, including its failings. But brothers and sisters, we've got to get focused on Jesus. 
and see the other things in their proper perspective. But as with all kingdom things, there's not just a now dimension to the vision, there's a not yet dimension to the vision. And the not yet dimension to the vision is found here. Verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven and he's going to transform our lowly bodies. And with these two points, I'm going to wrap up. Our citizenship is in heaven. Philippi was a Roman colony, and boy, were they proud of it. Roman magistrates, Roman law, Roman soldiers, Roman dress, Roman custom, Roman language, a hotline to Rome, a little Rome away from Rome. I don't know, it's not very good, that, but it was a little <laughs> colony there. Everybody was proud to be Roman. Paul says, don't you boast that you're Philippians... You know, certain towns have a sort of ethos about them, don't they? You know, I mentioned to you Luton. <laughs> and you go, yeah, you go, I'd love to live there. It's got a, got a flavor about it. Well, Philippi had a flavor about it. A good town, a quality town, a place to live, a protected place, a safe place. Paul says, don't you brag about your heritage. Don't you boast about your town. You boast that the not yet of your vision is that you are citizens of heaven and you're going somewhere else and that your real citizenship is there and you're just passing through. When you apply to be an American citizen, you have to go through a whole range of tests and questions and fill in a load of papers, and then there's a probationary period during which you have to live like an American citizen and they watch you, and if you live like an American citizen, when that period is over, you become one. Brothers and sisters, we are heavenly citizens, citizens of a far country, of another land, and we've got to live now as if we already were citizens of heaven, which we are. We've got to live out the kingdom values of the future and drag them back into the past, living out the now and the not yet of the kingdom here. We do live between these two principles. We are citizens of heaven. You and I are going to be with God when we die. We are saved as Christians. We're saved to serve, of course, but saved for a destiny which is wonderful and with God. What a thrilling and fantastic thing that is. And so we've got a strong vision because we know why we've been saved. Saved for that destiny. That's where we're going. When all this life is over, as it will be only too quickly, we know we've got a home in a special place where we'll be able to worship God forever, where every tear will be wiped away from our eye, every disability healed, every sickness gone, every infirmity finished, every mental uh, incapacity healed and restored, everything wonderful. We are citizens of that land. And we live out that citizenship now here on earth. And we do it because we know our lowly bodies, the last verse, are going to be transformed. Thrilling thing is this, that the Bible talks about our bodies not as being meaningless, and so you can do what you want with them, neither does it talk about pampering them and treating them too highly. It says our bodies will be transformed. Society goes like this in a pendulum about the body. It either says it's, you know, ignores it, or most modern culture, particularly in the Western world, pampers the body. I mean, we do live in a world where far too much attention is given to this shell. And so, you know, when I was growing up, you know, moose was an animal in Canada. (laughs) There were only three hairstyles for men, Parted, unparted, and departed. I mean, that was it. (laughs) And so we live in a world where our bodies are pampered. Everything is, is focused here, and that's the wrong emphasis. The biblical emphasis is that this body needs looking after. We mustn't abuse it. We mustn't do wrong things with it. But ultimately, it it isn't this body that's going to make it into the citizenship in heaven. It's a transformed body. Our bodies are going to have the glory touch from God. We're going to be set free. We're going to be new. We're going to be different. Everything about it is going to be right. All that's wrong is going to be right. All that's uh, disabled in any way is going to be made whole. All that's incapacitated in any way is going to be made complete and perfect and wonderful. And so we mustn't spoil the vision by legalism or license, but we must be in focus by pushing on towards the goal and having Jesus only as the center of our vision and recognize that our destiny isn't here. Our destiny is to be citizens of heaven with a body transformed and changed, totally new to God be glory. Amen.